Maravilha, gente. Então, boa tarde, oficialmente. Tá? Vamos chegando. Demo livre no estúdio. Ah, esse que já é o um encontro semanal do Amante da Arte da Aquarela. A gente traz aqui ah, demonstrações livres, né? ah, demonstração do processo de pintura. Então, eu pinto, sempre estou pintando, começo ao fim, trabalho inteiro. Né? Eu pego uma referência, pinto inteiro. Ah, a gente traz aqui é, assuntos sobre é, diversos, sobre arte, sobre a história da arte, a gente trouxe ainda bem pouco, quero trazer mais sobre história da arte, a gente fala sobre materiais, fala sobre processo artístico, ah, convido amigos meus, artistas, para pintar aqui comigo, tá? é livre, né? demo livre, demonstração livre, livre porque cada um que está aqui faz o que desejar, eu também faço que, o que desejar ali na hora, eu não tenho um script montado para isso, então eu abro a câmera, aqui, a câmera aqui, divido um pouco com vocês o meu dia a dia, a forma como a gente trabalha, a forma como Uh, eu faço como é o meu dia a dia aqui, como eu faço, como eu, como eu pinto, as outras coisas envolvidas com a pintura, que não é só a pintura propriamente dita, mas o processo de estudo, e o contato com outros artistas, né? isso eu, eu dou total importância para essa união e contato com os artistas, uh, nenhum artista pode trabalhar sozinho, o artista ele tem que trabalhar em conjunto, tem que partilhar, tem que conversar com outros, ver referências, uh, isso tem um ganho enorme no processo individual, artista de cada um, então Uh, a gente traz isso aqui também na Demo Livre. Tá? A gente fala sobre arte, criatividade, principalmente o processo da pintura. Tá? A gente traz aqui os workshops, as demonstrações que tem uh, em outros locais. Vocês têm a parte do chat ali que vocês podem compartilhar entre vocês. E, gente, é, uma, é um prazer estar aqui. Tá? Uh, um prazer enorme estar aqui com vocês. Uh, é recíproco. Uh, tem que ser divertido e prazeroso. Se não for, não vale a pena. Então, para mim, está sendo também. Vamos embora. Gente, vamos lá. Estou aqui com as minhas... Colas, a uh, pergunta, vocês façam, por favor, em caixa alto, o closed caption vai estar aberto, um, tá? O closed caption é a tradução, tá? Um, a Eliana está fazendo para mim a tradução ali, uh, vai digitar para mim as coisas que estão acontecendo. A Fabi, não encontrei ela, um, a Eli tinha se proposto a fazer também. Eli, vamos embora fazer isso, ela vai fazer o closed caption, então vai estar sendo traduzido, gente, em tempo integral, Tá, assim, o principal dos assuntos ali embaixo. Depois no YouTube também vai ter ali embaixo a, a legenda tá, traduzida e nas três línguas, português, espanhol e vai ter inglês também. Então aqui vocês podem acompanhar o que vai estar sendo falado, o que a gente vai estar falando aqui, vocês podem acompanhar ali no Close Caption. Para ter o Close Caption acionado, gente, vocês vão lá embaixo, na direita, tem ali uma, uma chavinha com um CC. Tá? Aquele é o Close Caption, tem um CC ali. Você não, vocês colocam na flechinha, tá? E coloca show subtitle, um, mostrar o subtítulo, tá? Que aí vai aparecer ali embaixo. Eu vou desligar o chat, gente, porque o chat não um, entra em conflito com o closed caption, tá? O chat não, não, você não consegue ver o chat e o closed caption ao mesmo tempo. Então eu vou desativar para a gente ver só o closed caption. Na hora que tiver pergunta, eu abro o chat e aí a gente vai um, a gente vai ler algumas perguntas ali e direcionar para o Andy Evans, o nosso convidado de hoje. Então, gente, é isso, tá? Quem fizer, ele vai trazer um, uma demonstração, ele vai fazer uma demonstração também, então ele vai ter a referência, essa referência eu vou passar para vocês depois no WhatsApp, não agora, tá? Na hora que a gente começar a pintar. E aí quem tiver produção, quem produzir, fizer exercício, coloca depois, posta, é importante a gente ver os resultados, eu quero ver os resultados que saíram aqui também, então vocês coloquem a hashtag eu na demo Arigóis, tá? Ah, para vocês poderem compartilhar, a gente ver o que cada um está fazendo. Então, gente, é isso. Tem, temos aqui ah, aquarelistas de todo o Brasil, do Uruguai, tá? eu tenho a listinha aqui, ah, Paraguai, Argentina, Chile, Peru, Estados Unidos, Austrália, temos gente da Filipinas, da Itália, de Portugal, da Espanha, da Rússia, é uma grande festa, Turquia, Índia, Tá? Paquistão, Nova Zelândia, Alemanha, everybody's very, very welcome. Thanks a lot. I'm just speaking Portuguese now um, with the Portuguese people, but people from all over the planet, all over the world, these other countries. And persona um, que hablo em espanhol também, bem, bem-vindo. Uh, estamos aqui com esse meu espanhol magnífico. 
podemos nos comunicar e tenho certeza que a gente consegue, a gente a se entender aqui, essa é a globalização, hoje a gente consegue todo mundo se entender, a, a arte unindo nós, nos unindo aí, a aquarela, então é, é, é magnífico ver isso. Todos estão bem, são bem-vindos, gente, eu vou ah, convidar, chamar aqui o nosso convidado agora, desligar o chat, vamos começar ali pelo, no close caption e vamos ver o que a gente tem para hoje. Vamos nos divertir aqui com Andy Evans, então deixa eu desligar aqui, gente, aqui o chat... Ah, depois eu abro e vocês podem mandar pergunta. Deixa eu ver se não tem mais nada aqui na minha cola que eu queria passar para vocês. Está tudo certo. Maravilha. Então, gente, está lá. Quem quiser ler o Close Caption tem que acionar aqui do lado, tá? Show Subtitles. Mostrar o subtítulo. E vamos embora. Vamos nessa. Deixa eu abrir aqui. Ah, muito bem. Uh, Andy Evansen, aquarelista americano de Vermilion, Vermilion, Vermilion. Uh, Minnesota, está uh, aqui com a gente, foi um convidado, um aquarelista que é, basicamente uh, trabalha com paisagem, é um aquarelista paisagista, uh, amo o trabalho plein air também, tem bastante em comum com o meu estilo de trabalho, com a forma como eu escolhi para trabalhar. Tá? Então, uh, ele vai estar tá aqui em novembro, Uh, do ano que vem, tá? nos dias 11, 12 e 13, já coloquem na agenda, um, e basicamente é isso. Andy, welcome here, thanks a lot for coming, I'm just saying people, to the, the people here, we are coming like next year, in November we have like 11, 12 and 13th, you're gonna <laughs> meet so. Brazilian artists, and yeah, yeah you, you are very welcome, thank you a lot. Uh, so, I'm, I was telling them, you're Uh, we're, we're talking from um, Vermilion, right? We are in Vermilion and Minnesota, where you are at now? Yeah, Minnesota. This is actually um, Hastings, Minnesota, the, 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 the town right next to it. So I live just outside of town. This is my studio in town. Um, so this is uh, Hastings, Minnesota, but close enough. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Happy to be All here. Right. Thanks for having me. Yeah, great. Yeah, this is a movement that we are, we create that in April. Thanks uh, the quarantine that you know uh, makes us to do that, and we're putting together artists, my friends here weekly, and talking about watercolor art process. And you're very welcome to share uh, your process, your painting style, and everything for us. We have two hours. Look, yeah. sounds a lot, but you you see, like two hours go just <laughs> like a. Yeah, it does. It goes fast. But luckily, I, I paint pretty fast, so I should have no problem. Okay, so, okay, Andy, um, tell us a little bit about your, your, your life there, how, like, you're working, how you're, like, dealing with all this quarantine stuff, and do you live, do you live next to your studio? Do you have a, a home studio or a studio home? Sometimes here at home is a home st studio home, not a home office, is a, right? Yeah. <laughs> We change yeah. the things. So, so I, I do have a, a studio in our house. It's basically just the basement. Uh, the lower level is where I work at home. And um, so, but I also, we rent this commercial space in town for me to be able to teach workshops out of and have, you know, paintings hanging. If people want to come and see some artwork, they can come to the gallery here and view, view work. So it's important to have both, but uh, you know, now with COVID uh, not a lot of people are out walking into stores and galleries and shopping. So I, I probably spend more time at home painting now than, than here. Uh, but I've been, staying busy giving zoom workshops and zoom demonstrations and yeah so we have that all set up here at the studio with the cameras and and the computers and everything so um uh, we're in here a few days a week still uh, working in the, the professional studio here but yeah i've been hanging out at home an awful lot like everybody else these days yeah that's true so uh the good thing is um we as an artist can reach people, uh, other students from other countries and vice versa, other 
any students from any place can reach like you and me from you know from all over the 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 the, the, the planet. So you have a student here, Daniela, right? Do you have a student a student yeah. here? Yeah, yeah you, you guys meet like the, yourself like um, on on internet and doing that. So this is a good thing about um, the COVID and social um, distance, right? And and about the 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 watercolor in your life, uh, Andy. How like uh, it gets in your life? How is art like when everything started with you? So uh, can you tell us about something about that? Like when sure. everything started? Yeah, sure. Um, so I've really been uh, doing some kind of artwork my whole life. Basically, I grew up with uh, in a pretty artistic family both of my parents could draw a little bit they weren't artists uh, professionally or anything but they could draw and uh, many of my siblings can draw i'm one of eight kids and um, we used to spend a lot of time you know with all the paint by numbers the oil kits as kids and uh, you know just drawing the walls <laughs> yeah yeah my, my dad worked for a, a paper company um in, in wisconsin and so we always had a lot of paper in the house and um drawing all the time i just uh, i can't remember a time when i wasn't doing something like that so uh when it came time you know to figure out what i wanted to do with my life i went to um the university of minnesota and they had a commercial illustration program that i entered there and um afterwards i found work as a medical illustrator in, in a, at a studio in Minneapolis and um, kind of trained on the job there. But this is a real, uh, the famous Mayo Clinic is here in Minnesota. People come from around the world to this is a big research facility. There's a lot of medical companies in uh, Minneapolis and St. Paul. And uh, so I was doing a lot of medical illustration work um, for several years. And then um, the computer kind of took over with Photoshop. And I started having to learn how to create illustrations using a, a computer and Illustrator and Photoshop, and um, which made my job easier, but I kind of missed having the painting supplies and art supplies, you know? And uh, so I just started painting watercolor for fun, basically, when I first started, um, just kind of a hobby, doing it for myself. And um, I think that actually really helped me in the long run. Uh, the fact that I wasn't in a hurry to get better and get into a gallery and make a name for myself. I just kind of worked at my own pace and, you know, learned it on my own for five years, very, you know, stress-free, no pressure. And, yeah. um, and it just slowly got better. And, but when I felt like I was good enough to start entering some local shows and and um, then won a couple of awards um, and then started getting asked to teach and then getting into yes. bigger shows and then teaching in other areas around the country and then overseas. And so it takes a long time for all that, to, you know, the ball to keep rolling and keep picking up, uh, you know, some recognition along the way. And um, but again, that the fact that I was making a good living doing medical art, uh, I wasn't, uh, you know, it was fine. I could just kind of take that 20 years or so, whatever it took yeah, for me yeah, to make a name yeah. for myself, you know. So I was definitely one of the lucky ones. But now uh, I still do a little bit of medical illustration work, a um, couple of projects here and there. But now I'm just so busy with watercolor, with with exhibitions and teaching and everything that that's now become my main career. This medical illustration is a big market. Even here is a big market. So people who does that, like they're like, there is no, no, no there is not so many people doing that. It's not just a few. Uh, yeah. Doing this, right. Yeah. Yep. It's kind of a niche uh, market, and you know the thing about the medical community, it doesn't, you know, the recession doesn't hit that. The other yeah. businesses yeah. slow down, and they just keep going. Yeah, it's, so it's kind of been a rece recession proof yeah. kind of an occupation being able to do that. So technical. So, mm -hmm. and why watercolor? Watercolor, um, Andy. Can you say something about that? Because like I can feel a big movement uh, without precedence in, in in the whole world, right? Uh, around the what watercolor, 
Uh, in China, you, you can say like in China is just growing so fast and so the people just, you know, loves watercolor and spreading all over the planet. Mm -hmm. Why watercolor? Mm -hmm. well, can you yeah, that's, a, that's a good question. I don't know. I mean, there was never any kind of a conscious choice that I made um, when I started to paint. I just always kind of loved watercolor. I think part of it is um, the, the speed that you can paint with watercolor kind of suited me at that time because I was looking for something different than the medical artwork, which was very labor intensive, you know, and, and detailed and just, you know, the, the feeling of being able to pull up brushes and water and paint and, and get a painting done rapidly. Yeah really that appealed to me. So uh, that's part of it. I was also working at home um, at the time. And um, so that helped too. I didn't have to set up oil paints with all this. Yeah, that's true. And everything. Um, so I was working with watercolor in, in the home studio. Um, so there were mul multiple factors that played into it. And I have done some oil painting. Um, I took courses from very famous uh, oil painting guy here in Minnesota, Joe Paquette. And he's taught a lot of people and um, he's become a really good friend. I took from him for about six years, I think, oil painting. But in the long run, it just kind of, I just realized yeah. I was a watercolor artist and yeah, yeah, yeah. stuck with it. The flow, right? Yeah, the flow yeah. of the water and everything just goes different. And, I love it. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And uh, you're traveling a lot. So uh, before the, the COVID stuff. Yeah. And, <laughs> Do you see that movement about watercolor in the planet too? And what's the difference between the countries? Like everybody's going through and the students like are looking for teachers and the schools and how, how like you see that all this movement about the students and they're looking for, you know what I mean? Like they're looking for information and- um, Yeah, but I think a lot of that is, um, maybe born out of social media too. Uh, people are exposed to a lot more artists all over the world on Instagram and Facebook. And a lot of those, um, you know, people are teaching little classes or whatever, but uh, it just kind of, I'm sure it opened people's eyes to, you know, the, the amount of the number of different ways that you can be creative and, and paint. And it, it was less scary seeing, you know, all these other people out there um, becoming artists so there's there's probably you know a big demand for that now of course with everybody home and you know not able to go anywhere I, I think people are really looking for you know something to do also and the fact yeah. that we come into their homes on the computer screen and give them a, a lesson in painting that's definitely helped also uh, but even yeah, before sure. you know even before COVID um, you know uh, I don't know maybe it's just kind of a there's a lot of people that embrace all the technology and life becomes busier and busier all the time. And, uh, but people really need a creative outlet to, uh, you know, it's part of the human condition to want to do that. And no, no matter what it is, painting, writing, you know, photography, ceramics. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think people are starting to realize that more and more that, uh, yeah. that, that, that creative side of us is just as important as everything yeah. else. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Maybe it's a big opportunity to themselves, to ourselves, right? Because we are including that to to look for a little bit to to inside, right? What's happening inside? Yeah. Um, yeah. Even like inside the house with the family and ourselves with, with our plans and everything, the art process in ourselves and everything. I think it's a big opportunity. Yeah, that's true. And how the social media uh, influenced you? Because we have like a three big transformations in the society. Uh, uh, actually, with us too, as an artist, the first one was like in the same, 18th century, the photo and the, the, the pictures, when the camera came to the, the, the society, influenced a lot uh, the artists at the mm -hmm. time. So mm -hmm. the second one for me was the, 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 the computer. When the computer came to the studio, blow up everything. So the, we changed the, the brushes and papers and new names like, uh, Park Express and Freehand and right Illustrator yeah, came to the, 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 the office, so to the studio. And now the social media is a big change too. Uh, how do you, um, how influenced you that all this third change and how do you deal with that now today? Um, because I have lots of friends, Andy, that 
you know, they just give give it away, and they they are still in their studio without any camera, anything, any anything technological uh, besides them, and they are suffering some the, the consequence. So, mm -hmm. um, how are you dealing with that? How you how you do deal with that now? Can you see yeah, something? Yeah, um, you know, that's a tough one. Uh, with social media, it's kind of a double-edged sword, right? You. Um, it's allowed us to reach a lot more people around the world. Obviously, I wouldn't be doing this <laughs> right here today if it wasn't for social media. Uh, when people are able to be aware of your artwork, you know, at the click of a button. Um, so in a lot of ways, it's, it's helped artists. But, um, you know, th that pressure when you're just constantly seeing other people producing work, um, good work and putting it out there all the time to market, um, you know, you kind of, that's always in the back of your mind. Like I should be putting paintings out on Instagram and Facebook if it hasn't been a few days. And um, I think it's led to a little bit of, you know, just kind of flooding. I, I've purposely tried to hold back. I mean, I, I paint almost every day um, and I, I can't post everything I paint. I, I don't want to post <laughs> one that I'm not happy with. Okay. Exactly. But I, I, a lot of it is for marketing my workshops and stuff when I'm posting lessons or paintings, but I want to make sure that I'm happy with the, the artwork too, and not just feel this need to be out there all the time, you know, um, just kind of feeding the machine. Uh, and because you can get lost in the shuffle that way, you know, there's just so much <laughs> yeah, out there. True. Yeah. So I, I'd true. rather, I'd rather do fewer posts, but that are better than just kind of keep, you know, uh, being out there constantly on social media. But there's definitely that that pressure to feel that way when you're, you know, anytime you're on Instagram and you start scrolling through. Exactly, yeah. Thousands of paintings out there. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's like everything, it's good and bad. Yeah, that's true. And we lose a little bit, um, we lose some, we lose the reference to, right? Um, if you just start to, you know, scroll up and down the, the, the the thing we just lose the reference what is good what is not and yeah. what we have to follow and i ask them i ask my students all the time don't use instagram or facebook as a reference i try to study the, the old artists the famous ones on the from the past and now it's very easy to lose the reference the the the, the social media that's the the, the the bad point of of it that i can see you know? Right. Yeah, there's a lot of conformity going on. You know, you see a lot of people kind of painting the same stuff the same way. Um, and I get it, you know, there's, um, you know, there's definitely ways to handle watercolor in particular, um, you know, seems to suffer from that. But it's really important to try and, you know, find your own voice too, maybe even more so now with all that noise out there. And so I think um, instead of just trying to, kind of copy, like you were saying, using Facebook for reference or Instagram and just kind of using that same old meth, tried and true method, but trying to stand out from the crowd a little bit, you know, and that's, I know that's easier said than done. It takes a long time to develop kind of your own style where people can recognize it, you know, by looking at it and say, that looks like Ari's work or that looks like Andy's work. Um, that's not something that happens, you know, overnight. It comes from the, the subjects you choose, the color palette you choose, the kind of marks you make, you know, all that stuff goes into the subjects that you paint, you know, all that goes into make, giving you a recognizable style. And, and, um, yeah. and again, that goes back to that thing I was saying before, so many people are in such a rush you know, they started painting six months ago and they're wondering how they can get into a gallery. <laughs> Come on, man, give yourself time. You know? <laughs> I want to work with Walter Cole, I want to be an artist, like three, yeah, three months study. Yeah, people have to understand that uh, that's a lot, a lot of study involved in it. And so uh, it's not easy and there, there is no shortcut, right? You have yeah. to study a lot and, yeah, examples like that I like to to bring here to you know explain and um, saying that with me because like it's a day by day during the class explaining that and uh, telling people that the things the results is not coming like in an easy way there is not shortcut for that so that's important yeah, uh, yeah. and the good thing is you can improve the the the, the base of the the the, the 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 art process that's important. That's yeah. cool. So uh, um, let's talk a little bit about your work, Andy. Uh, 
I can feel a lot of mood in your painting. Um, I know you love uh, outdoor paintings like uh, plein air, the plein air uh, painting. Yeah. I'm a plein air lover too. During these times, I you know, keep myself in the studio. Sometimes I can just go out a little bit like early in the morning and come back fast. So uh, are you like painting outdoor sometimes? And tell us a little bit about the, the, the plein air and outdoor process with you. Sure. Um, yeah, well, living in, I live in the Northern part of the US. We're basically Canada where I'm living and we've had snow on the ground for two weeks already. So that's, that's one of the cool. biggest. Yeah, that's cool. yeah, yeah, it snowed here a couple of weeks ago, which is early, but it's not that terribly unusual. And um, so, you know, being a watercolor artist living here, that definitely um, hinders how much I can get out in plein air paint um, with the freezing temps already. But, you know, when the weather's nice, I try and get out there when I can. Um, it's, it's, it's nice to balance both. I know there are people in both camps. There are a lot of people that just say, I can't, I can't paint from a photo. I have to be outside, you know, and there's a lot of people who want to just be in the studio, you know, being outside is intimidating and it's too much for them. And they just like the comfort of the studio. I like both. Um, and they both kind of play off each other. When I plein air paint, you know, your time is limited. That subject is changing so fast. And, you know, um, by trying to choose a subject that I can tackle in an hour, hour and a half, whatever, two hours at the most. And um, I kind of approach it the same way when I'm in the studio. You know, I don't set a time or anything. But just, just because I'm working yeah. from a reference photograph, that's not going to change. I don't slow down and get tight yeah, 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 yeah. in the studio. I try to do the same, yeah. Yeah, I try and paint the same way. I don't want people looking at my paintings and saying, oh, that was plein air and that was studio. Yeah, that, that just tells me that I'm getting too tight with my studio work. Um, and I still want it to look like a painting. So, you know, there's benefits of it. You can draw a little bit more. You can plan a little bit more ahead of time, uh, you know, but uh, boy, that time spent outside really helps um, when you're in the studio. And it just, you start to learn to compensate for the, the shortcomings of the camera too. You know, when you're looking at photographs, a lot of times the sky is washed out or the shadows are too black or, um, you know, you see it a lot when people put figures in their paintings, the figures look like they're too stiff because they're just painting from photographs. I like to make things, you know, if these animated objects, trees and animals and people, or, or if the cars are moving, I try and paint them a little bit more gesturally to make them look like they're alive and not like it was painted from a photo. Oh, great, yeah. The, there is an interesting thing about your place and my place here. Um, the angle of the sun during the, 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 um, the springtime or even the, um, any, 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 any situation, just the sun just go through straight to the sky here. The <laughs> best angle here takes like 15 minutes for us here. Oh. I can imagine for you like the best angle of the sun like takes the whole day you have the whole the whole day to paint that beautiful light right exactly. and here it takes just five 15 minutes and you just take notes and oh my god i have to rush because the sun in 15 minutes is like everything is bright and you know white it's so and fast. It's it's so, so fast. fast so yeah. and this is a dream when i go to a place like that in the, in the, in the north america like pretty, pretty high where, where the sun is takes like a, a little angle. Yeah. It's, a, it's a dream, yeah, yeah. You have it's pretty low here have... already because we're so far north. The sun's already kind of stays low over the horizon, uh, not as bad as it will. In a, in a few months, we won't have much light at all, but um, you can just kind of see it. I love living somewhere where there's seasons like that though. Um, I couldn't live in like Southern California where it's just 70 degrees and sunny, you know, all the time. I love having summer and fall and winter and spring, you know, and as a landscape painter, every few months, the world is changing. It's just, con you constantly have to kind of, you know, stay sharp and, and you don't yeah. get comfortable when it's changing that much. And I, I love it. I love being able to. Yeah, you know, that's paint. true. I've got, I've got paintings up here of all different seasons, you know, it's just fun. Yeah, cool. See, cool. That's great. So, um, yeah, that's cool. Um, let's talk a little bit about the process too. Um, 
the watercolor, um, you choose watercolor, you paint watercolor today. You didn't make any uh, art class, a formal class of art. Um, instead, like the the the, the scientific the scientific one, uh, did you do did, did you make uh, some art class on the past to apply today in the watercolor or just you don't you did just by yourself and. Yeah, well, what I uh, what I teach, and Daniela can attest to this, I talk about value studies a, a lot. Um, I, I won't have time. I won't do a value study today during the demonstration. I don't really need to. The shapes are really obvious. But I'll show you some examples of what I teach oh, in my workshops um, and how I use a value study to kind of plan. I, I always look at watercolor like it's three big washes, the light, the middle values, and then the darks for detail at the end. And um, so I approach my value studies that way. Um, I just leave the white of the paper that represents the light wash. Um, and then I just go right to the middle value wash on my value study. And that seems to be the stage of the painting that trips most people up because uh, the light wash, you're just kind of getting rid of the white of the paper. The details everybody sees anyways, all the little stuff, the people and the windows and the cars and everything. But taking in that subject, um, you know, whether it's a street scene or a farm or, you know, whatever, a harbor scene full of boats with all those objects, the boats and the water and the buildings or the, the buildings and the cars and the people and finding a way to simplify it into just a couple of big shapes to paint is really difficult. It takes a lot of you know, time to learn how to see that, not see all the little separations, but see the connections. And these value study things that I teach, I think are really, have really helped people. Um, you know, it, it's, it's still a challenge for them to see that, but it gives them something to work towards without having to worry about color and everything in it too, just, you know, kind of doing a flat wash. So I'll show you some examples of those when I go up to my table here. I don't know when you're ready for that. But. That's a great method. Um, so you can say the, the main thing for you uh, in the landscape is uh, the, the, the big shapes or what exactly you look for when you're like, what attracts you in a, in a landscape? Like, oh, this is a, I call it like a click. What, what is a click for you? Oh, that's a, here is a click. I have to paint that. So yeah. what attracts you? You know what I mean? Like, oh, I have to paint that. Definitely. Yeah, and it's but hard to put your finger on. Sometimes, kind of sometimes it's the quality of light. Sometimes it's uh, the subject is really cool. Sometimes it's the mood, the atmosphere, you know? So it's never really one thing, um, unfortunately, that you're trying to capture. It's just- um, it's Complex, it's, yeah. Yeah, and, it, and you never know what it's gonna be from day to day either, how you're feeling, you know? Like today, I think, you know, whenever I do a demonstration painting, I kind of joke, people wanna have, you know, what are you gonna paint? And they're asking me two weeks ahead of time. I'm like, I don't know, I'm gonna choose that morning. <laughs> <laughs> see what I feel like painting you know so because um, it is it just changes with your mood every day it might be something you know you wake up and you know you need a little shot yeah, of fire something different but yeah I mean and that's you know that I walk around there's a lot maybe I'll just kind of show you okay okay depends on how you are at the day right yeah too yeah exactly so sometimes maybe it's you know uh, a soft moody little oh, wow. painting. That's, that's a beautiful one Thanks. Yeah, yeah it, was, it was just that pink That's cloud. Look at that. That, that, that sunset. Yeah, it's beautiful. With the big oh. ships, you know. And then, you know, living in the Midwest, sorry for the glare. Uh, you know, living in the Midwest, you see a lot of these old abandoned farmhouses. And I love yeah. winter. I, mean, I love snow and winter. So, you know, something like that, where it's just an old abandoned farmhouse with the light hitting it, um, you know, that might stir me to, to paint something. Um, you know, springtime comes. I love living in farm country. I love painting cows and everything too. So, um, we'll get uh, that tree. Really different light, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so it just kind of depends on, you know, in this one, there, this is right in the town here where my studio is. They were tearing down the old big bridge and building a new one. I'm just trying to capture that, that all that activity of a construction zone, you know. Um, so, yeah, and this one was from in China. Just a, a sunset, you know, that one is definitely, you know, the mood and the atmosphere of the sunset, but also that beautiful shape of all the, you know, the village and the boats and stuff along the shore. Right place, right? Yeah. Um, so, 
again, um, you just kind of never know from day to day what, what it is you're going to want to paint. Here's another kind of, I like the figures, you know, on this one, kind of looking down from that vantage point above down on the beach and trying to capture all their little gestures as they're moving around, swimming and, you know, rearranging blankets and stuff, whatever. So, um, yeah. Yeah, cool. I, I that's like a lot of freedom. Thing. Yeah, that's a lot of freedom to choose the subject, just to feel what, like, you know, uh, calls inside you and not, oh, I just, I'm going to just paint a uh, landscape or marine or boats and no, just be open to whatever you want to at the time. This is, this is very nice. That's a very, that's cool. Yeah. yeah. No, I don't want to be like pigeonholed and, uh, you know, this is the guy who paints, you know, cows or something. <laughs> well, I, I like to, it's a big, beautiful world. I like to paint it all. Yeah. And landscape. Yeah. Landscape like gives to you that every landscape is everything. So you are out and you're in a landscape. That's it. Yeah. Cool. yeah. Okay. And great. Um, see, yeah. So we, we can keep talking if you want to paint something. I don't know what, what time is it? Now? Yeah. Why don't I move yeah, over? If you want to, if you want to let Laura share the screen again. 20 I'll, to, yeah. I'll over 20 minutes mute. to three o'clock. What time is it now? 12? Uh, it's 12. I took your lunch time. Huh? I, I took 40. your lunch time. Yeah. <laughs> I took your lunch time. You're starving. You can't keep eating something with Laura. <laughs> if you hear a weird noise, it's my stomach growling. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't do that. Make a sandwich or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Take your time to eat something. <laughs> yeah, I'm okay. I'm good. No oh, worries. that's fine. Okay. So I'm going to mute okay. this computer and move over to my desk, okay? Oh, perfect. Yeah. Let go. Are you still uh, president of Papa? Okay, you should be good here with the speaker. Let me share my screen. Hi, Laura. <laughs> you can see Laura now? You can hear her at least? Yeah, yeah. you can. Oh, yeah, you can see her too. Good. <laughs> cool. Okay, um, so here's, I'm gonna do the picture in picture so you can see the setup here too. So this is what I'm gonna be painting today. Um, this is the little town that I live in. I've painted this, um, that church many times before. Um, and I knew our time was gonna be somewhat limited so I didn't wanna you know, tackle anything that was gonna take too much time or too much drawing. Um, but it'll give me a chance to, you can just kind of see uh, watch me paint. I'll talk about if you have questions about um, the colors I use or whatever, just let me know. Sure. Okay. Uh, can I talk about you want me to move that gallery? Um, yeah, that's fine for now. Okay. okay. I'm sending the I'm sending the reference to the people, and this is a very yeah, this is a very nice one. It's a snowy one. Snowy. Uh, we have this snow here. Last week. This was taken just last week. So uh, yeah. Wow. That's what I was saying. We've already had snow in town, so yep. It's a nice look. Is it in the right time, or it's kind of? No, it's um, yeah, kind of. Oh, it's early morning actually. The sun. This is looking east, so the sun is just coming up in the distance. So when I uh, was trying to, you know, compose this photograph, I should talk about composition a little bit here too. Um, when you're organizing your photos, uh, it's important to. I'm trying to typically kind of zoom in and, and find fewer shapes, all right? Um, and it might look like it's split half and half, but the, the road is actually a little bit below um, center here. So, uh, but I wanted to leave room for the, these nice reflections in the street. That was a big part of why I took this photograph, okay? Um, so I didn't want to crop it too much. Um, but so the road is about a little bit lower than halfway. But when you when you think about it, the, the church steeple up here, you know, kind of spotlit against the morning sky, that's definitely one of the stars of the show. OK, uh, you've got all this beautiful light and reflections in the puddles. There's a lot else going on in here, obviously. But when I'm trying to place the star of the show, it's a good idea to, to just kind of think in terms of separating your ah, separating your paper into thirds, okay? So if you go a third from side to side and a third from top to bottom, if you look at where that church steeple is, this is about where my road is, okay? That church steeple is right about here on my painting, okay? When I go across it, whoops, I gotta show them that. So you can, you can kind of see how I organize that uh, the paper surface, the painting surface to make sure that it's 
you know, off center at a good spot, not too close to the top of the side. Okay. Um, so that's uh, one of the important aspects when you're trying to, you know, organize your photo and just trying to choose that scene. Again, not having the road halfway, the road's a little bit lower down here. Okay. That car is kind of sitting right about here on the page. So it, the, the, the painting surface is split up kind of unevenly. And one of the main stars is at a good point on the paper. So that was one of my, my considerations on here. Perfect. Okay, so here's my road. And then when I do my little uh, drawing here, um, I'll try and I won't draw for too long. But and I know it's probably gonna be difficult to see at first, but I start very lightly just kind of making some little marks on the paper. And I make sure everything is gonna fit first before I tighten up my drawing and that it's in the right spot, okay? Because there's if you start drawing right away, there's a good possibility you're gonna make a mistake and then you have to erase it. And if you're drawing too dark, you're trying to erase dark pencil lines and you're disturbing the surface of the paper. So I usually start you know, pretty lightly first, uh, like I said, and just make sure everything is gonna fit on the page and be where I need it before I um, come back in and tighten up the drawing a little bit more. Okay, so I've, yeah. I've got- What really, kind of paper are you using, Andy? Uh, this is Saunders, uh, Saunders Waterford, 140 pound rough. So rough, it's, right. it's a soft paper and this, the rough isn't even as rough as the Arches cold press. It doesn't have as much texture as, uh, as Arches yeah. or some of the other papers. So I like that. I like the softness of it. Um, it's a it's a paper that I can lift a little bit off of too later on if I'm trying to lift some color off. It, it helps. It's not quite as absorbent as some of the other papers. Okay. Okay. So here's that house, the steeple. Right. Um, so I'm gonna. I'll uh, when I start drawing now. I'll darken this up just a bit for you here. And I don't, um, you know, I try and keep my drawing fairly simple to um, try not to get, uh, I leave the pencil on the paper if I can and do kind of a contour drawing so that I'm concentrating more on the outside of a shape and not the, it keeps me away from drawing windows and, and too much little detail. There's a lot of things in here that I want to just paint with the brush um, and not have to fill in the, a pencil mark. So I'm, I'm usually sticking to the outside of these shapes when I'm doing my drawing and staying away from drawing details inside of it. Yes. Okay, and there's this parked car here and the road in the background. There's somebody trying to start a snowblower already here, it looks like. <laughs> Don't draw the tree. I'm just kind of giving myself to knowing how high it is, but that's just going to be a quick dry brush um, shape. I don't want to draw that too much either. They are all naked. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You don't have to draw them. Just use a dry brush and knock them in with a, with a little bit of paint at the end. Okay. So all the big shapes are on there. I don't need to draw much more than that. The only thing you might want to do um, would be to draw a couple of the puddles, but even that, I usually tell my students, don't worry about, it doesn't matter where those puddles are. People aren't going to have any idea that your puddle is in a different spot than it was in the photograph, okay? The only thing I have to pay attention to is when I paint the reflection of the church steeple, that when I put that in, I have to make sure it's underneath the steeple. And same thing over here, some of these darker tree reflections, I have to make sure that I'm putting them under the tree. But other than that, it doesn't matter where your puddles end up. So I don't even bother drawing those. Exactly. And that's it. Yeah. So then I take a kneaded eraser and pull off some of the graphite just so it doesn't smear much or, you know, uh, when I'm wetting the paper, I can still see those dark pencil marks enough. Cool. And then I'm going to wet both sides of my paper. I don't tape my paper down or staple it down to the surface. Um, I usually just you know, paint on the loose piece of paper. Um, this is a quarter sheet size, uh, which is very comfortable. It's, um, you know, most of those paintings I just showed you on the wall of my studio are quarter sheet. And quarter. you put a mat and a frame on it, it's a pretty good size painting. So I don't need to work larger than that. 
But if I wet both sides of the paper, it'll keep it from buckling too much and curling up. It kind of stays flat on my drawing board a little bit better. And it also stays damp a little bit longer so I can kind of get those wet edges. I have more time to get those in before it dries. And I noticed that a lot more these days, um, painting inside, we've had to have the heat on already because it's so cold out. And when the heat, yeah. the house is drier, you know, so you can just, everything is drying out more quickly than if I was you know, working outside in humid conditions. But you can kind of see what's already happening on my paper here, because I wet just the back, it, it starts to curl. The back of the paper is trying to expand and the front is yeah. still dry, okay? So it's totally curling up. Okay. I have to wet, if I just wet the front, it'd be the other opposite. And I'd be trying to paint you know, on something like this on my table where it's curled. Yeah. So if you yeah. wet both sides, it stays down a little bit better. There you go. Are you in a, in a dry place now or? I'm sorry? Inside the studios. Are you in a dry place now or? Yeah, it's, yeah, we're in the studio. The, the heat's been running. It's in the it's like 25, 30 degrees outside. And oh, wow, that's cold. Fahrenheit, yeah. So the heat's been running. It'll dry faster. It's like I use a sponge to wet my paper instead of a brush because I just try and get the paper damp. And a brush, you know, if you wet it with a big mop brush, they hold yeah. so much water. You put too much water on your paper. But if I use a sponge, I can get the sponge wet and squeeze it out. So I'm just getting a little bit of water on the surface of the paper. That helps. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, so the whole paper is damp, good to go. So the, my first wash is basically just putting in all the lights, okay? So this light pinks and blues and, the, and obviously the nice gold where the sun is coming up and that's reflecting down into the wet road, okay? So all these darker shapes, the trees, the snow, the church, everything, that'll be put on top later. So I'm not worried about painting around them. I'm just gonna cover the whole paper with that sky wash. Okay. I'm gonna go ahead and start with that gold near the horizon. Now, you have to be careful when you're putting your light wash on. People tend to misjudge this light wash because um, you have nothing to compare it against or compare it to except the white of the paper. So they, they go too pale with it all the time. They're worried about that first wash being too dark. But you have to remember this first wash dry, has a lot of drying to do. And the more a wash has to dry, the more it's gonna fade and lighten. So my paper is wet, my puddles are very wet. This is gonna, has a lot of drying to do. It's gonna fade quite a bit, okay? So you yeah. gotta push these colors. It's uncomfortable, like I said, when you're putting them on because they look way too dark um, compared to uh, the white of the paper. But I don't wanna have to come in and paint this sky again, okay? It's better to, if your sky is just fresh and painted once. So that's another thing you learn as you go. You kind of learn to compensate for that um, and not get too weak with those early washes. Make sure that you're getting some really nice color on here. Oh, thanks, Andy. That's a lot of information about your process. There is 250 people here watching you from wow. many places. Yeah, thanks, man. Now I'm nervous. <laughs> uh, me too. <laughs> don't screw up, huh? <laughs> yeah, don't screw up. <laughs> wow, that's a lot. Thanks, everybody. That's amazing. Yeah. They're saying here for sure in the chat. No, the chat is un un unavailable. But yeah, thanks, man. No this problem. What kind, of, uh, what kind of paint are you using? Um, so this is Cronacridone Gold. Brand? Uh, uh, most of my paints are Windsor Newton. Uh, but uh, okay. my raw sienna is Holbein. The lavender is Holbein. I, think oh, my I love Holbein too, some colors. Yeah, Holbein yeah. is good. Uh, but the colors I'm using is uh, cadmium lemon, quinacridone gold. I'm throwing just a touch of um, opera pink in um, as I'm going up here now. Uh, to, as I, it's good to 
people ask me this too. How do you go from the yellow part of the sky to the blue part of the sky without it all turning green? Um, well, number yeah, one. That's a good question, yeah. yeah. So if you have a little bit of that pink transitional uh, exactly. air to go from yellow to orange to pink and then to blue, um, it won't turn quite so green on you. Yeah, I have something here on my back too. From the yellow the, 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 to the, the blue, it all turning everything in the green. Yep. So I need to put some of this um, down below here too. It's reflecting down in here. So I'm going to start knocking in some of these yellows down below. I'm painting this, by the way, with my eyes almost shut. I'm trying to not see detail. I'm just trying to see values and where these big areas of color are. And I'm really, I won't look at this with my eyes wide open and study it until I'm putting the details in. For now, I'm just trying to deal with big stuff, big shapes. It's hard to do this stage of the painting. Uh, like I said, it's, people want their paintings to look like something right away. And you know, this first stage especially, it's just kind of a big wet mess. Yeah, this preparation for the future. Yeah, exactly. That's all this is. Getting ready to put the details on later. I use the, the comparison of make a, um, like a, a cake. Uh, the cake is not ready um, when it's still out of the oven. So we cannot eat the cake without the without go to the oven. The, the paint is not ready when like in the halfway. Some exactly. students have this confusion. Oh, my paint is like, like awful. No, but didn't finish. You have to finish. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's another thing. People give up on their paintings way too soon. They'll send it the halfway. Yeah. yeah. They're half done with it and they're not happy with it. I'm like, you, you should see what happens to some of my paintings in the last 10, 15 minutes when I put in windows and people and cars and it all comes alive. You know, you got to give it a chance to develop. Yeah. 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 Okay, so now I'm going to slowly start transitioning to like cerulean blue and pink up on the top. It's getting a little lighter. It's definitely more intense down below by the sunset. So, do you have some angle in your painting? A little bit, right? Five to ten degrees? Just a little bit, yeah. Maybe exactly, you know, like five ten degrees. Um, my my table at home is is sloped a little bit more. Uh, this is the table that I use for my demonstrations, and it would throw off the perspective if it was tilt. So I keep this a little bit flatter. Um, but yeah, at home, uh, my table might be tilted a little bit more, like fifteen degrees, but not much. Um, I don't. I try and tell my students that I don't want all my washes to run to the bottom. Okay, sometimes nice. that's. I want the bead at the right side of the paper. So I try not to slope it so much that everything is just rushing down. Okay, so there's some more blue up on top here. Just kind of transitioning down. It's going to stay damp for a little while. I'll probably have to take a little break in a, in a bit here and, um, like I said, let it dry before I can come in and put too much more detail in. But time to have some some okay. sandwich, some fruit Give juice. A chance to eat something. <laughs> <laughs> to eat something, don't be starving. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now I'm going to start putting in some of the more of a kind of silver color down below here. This is all going to be covered up later. Yeah, that's a beautiful t t transition. Yeah, right? Just working big, yeah. keeping it fluid. Oof. A little bit darker on this side again uh, where the tree is blocking it there's not a lot of yellows over here so i can just kind of fill this corner in a bit more
Thanks, Eli, for translating everything. Yeah, thank you. My Spanish is not so good yet. <laughs> yeah, I can I can't even imagine in your Portuguese. <laughs> <laughs> But some people who who does who speaks uh, Spanish can understand a little bit of Portuguese. Um, the Portuguese from Brazil is a little bit different, even different from the the, the, the Portuguese from Portugal. Wow. So different accents and some different words and like um, um, English from United States and English from um, yeah. from English. London. Yeah. yeah, from London. Like a, exactly. Some Australian, Australian from Melbourne, it's different. So I'm trying to keep the glow of the sunset here. I've got a little bit of the reflection already soft from the church steeple. Obviously, I'll have to put some darker ones in later. But in general, I'm just trying to give it a little bit of a reflection coming down here right away um, in this wet wash. And then same thing over here. Most of the sun is blocked by the trees, so there's not a lot of this glow in this area, so I just covered almost all of that over here with this wash. Now while it's still wet, come back in and, um, you know, I can go a little bit darker. I like to kind of work wet into wet more if I can. Like I said, when I wet both sides of the paper, it, it allows me to do this a little bit more. That softness that you get from, you know, keeping that paper damp and not always letting it dry before you get to the next stage, um, I think is really nice. But um, pretty soon here, I'm going to have to pause because, um, th like I said, there's the uh, the middle value shapes. Pretty soon are going to be the the snow, the sharper shape of the church steeple, and then of course dry brush up above. So uh, is it okay if I take like a five minute break in a little bit and kind of? I, I hate to use a blow dryer, but I might have to do that here. Yeah, sure. Um, take okay. it in the back and use a blow dryer. So I'll I'll let you talk in Spanish amongst yourselves while I do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no problem. Yeah, so, I'll be right back. Yeah. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna paint something. <laughs> yeah, just take your time. Uh, beleza. Turma, então, um, ele tá, botou para secar a aquarela, a primeira etapa. Vai secar um pouco ali com o secador. Um, tem muita coisa em comum na forma como eu pinto, não só o Andy Evans, mas outros aquarelistas que buscam um caminho mais clássico e gostam de pintar plein air. Uh, basicamente, quem pinta paisagem vai vai pintar plein air. Né? Uh, claro que paisagem dentro do estúdio, você tem referência fotográfica. Paisagem, plein air, você tem ela viva. São duas, duas, dois degraus bem diferentes de trabalho. Uh, então tem muito parecido, vai ter muito em comum tipo de artista que pinta paisagem, que pinta plenário. Então tem muita coisa em comum com ele, uh, muita coisa em comum com outros artistas que pintam plenário, assim como artistas de óleo, né? Uh, ele falou ali atrás que teve aulas com um grande artista de óleo ali perto da cidade. Uh, e assim a essência da pintura, gente, ela vai ser igual para quem pinta óleo, para quem pinta aquarela, para quem pinta acrílica. A essência criativa e a essência do que se busca numa pintura de paisagem, em plein air, ela vai ser a mesma. Então, artistas que seguem esse caminho, eles têm muito em comum, né? É uma linguagem muito em comum. Quando a gente senta para pintar, senta para conversar, a gente vê como nós somos iguais em algumas coisas e vivemos tão diferentes, crescemos em outros países, em outros locais distantes, e como a gente tem algumas coisas em comum, assim. Assim como para quem pinta um, outros estilos, como uh, no artístico, no um, artístico, é, modelo vivo ou o próprio retrato, né? Ah, o artista que busca ah, coisas numa pintura de retrato vai ter muito em comum com outros artistas nesse sentido também que escolheram esse caminho. Então é interessante ver isso, é bacana ter ele partilhando. Ah, e também ele trouxe aqui que não gosta de usar secador, gosta que seca naturalmente, porque, claro, as fusões ali elas vão acontecendo enquanto a aquarela está molhada e está acontecendo... Né, a fusão, ela está viva. Uma vez que você seca, você interrompe o processo e você deixa de é, ter alguns efeitos ali que eles acontecem naturalmente. Então, ah, ele foi secar ali agora, mesmo ah, não gostando de secar. Claro que uma demonstração para acelerar um pouco o processo, a gente seca. É, num dia de pintura ao ar livre que está muito úmido, a gente tem dificuldade com isso, 
porque não tem o um secador e, num caso desse, que ele tem pouco sol lá durante o outono e o inverno, o ângulo do sol sobe muito pouco no céu, então o dia não esquenta, você está ali com o céu no topo, no máximo dele, o, o dia está frio, extremamente frio, extremamente úmido, não esquenta, são meses assim. Então, para quem pinta plein air, hum, tem que enfrentar essa realidade de o trabalho estar tá mais úmido. Então, até por isso que ele trabalha com o, a, o papel dele mais úmido, Uh, se adaptou com isso. Uh, eu aqui em Florianópolis também tenho essa situação de bastante umidade, porém a calor seca mais rápido, no vento também seca mais rápido, né? E quando eu estou no estúdio aqui, eu adapto uma quantidade de umidade que tem. Então, ou eu deixo o ar-condicionado ligado se eu quero que seque um pouco mais rápido, ou eu desligo o ar-condicionado e deixo a umidade um, invadir um pouco, seca mais lento. Uh, e é isso, gente. Deixa eu ver, eu poderia abrir aqui um pouco o chat até ele voltar para ver se alguém tem alguma pergunta, eu anoto aqui e pergunto para ele, tá certo? Vocês podem mandar ali alguma pergunta, manda em caixa alta, letra maiúscula, a gente tem letra maiúscula, uh, minúscula, vocês falam entre vocês, tá aberto ali o chat, uh, vocês podem perguntar, se vocês tiverem alguma pergunta, já falar bastante ainda, tá na metade do caminho, tem outras perguntas técnicas que eu vou falar para eles sobre o material, que tipo de pincel, uh, então isso daí eu já vou fazer automático, e é isso, gente. Espero que vocês estejam gostando. Um, fiquem à vontade para fazer perguntas. O que mais que eu posso falar? O Andy Evanson, ele é presidente do Papa. Até quero falar um pouco mais sobre isso. O Papa é os pintores plein air dos Estados Unidos, americanos. Então, é o Plein Air Painting of America. Uh, vamos, vamos, se der tempo, a gente falar um pouco sobre isso, que é uma associação só de pintores plein air americana, bem forte, muito bem representado lá, ele era presidente, não sei se ainda é. Um, deixa eu, o azul com o cerulho, tá? Um, ele tá usando o Saunders Waterfall. A mesa tá inclinada, 10 graus, 5, 10 graus. Tá? They have more questions that they want me to address? Uh, yes, I have some questions here, I'm taking care of that. What kind of blue are you using? Like, if you have some angle in the watercolor, And if you eat something already, because people are worried about that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no, I'm good. <laughs> yeah, lose some more. <laughs> yeah, people, like, people here is a word like, oh, my God, he has to eat. So uh, I was explaining then the, the, the process of, you know, um, making the, all the paper wet and everything. So that's fine. I, I um, answer them already. Let me just turn off the... Um, Huh? Turn off the chat again. Um, yeah. I think it's I think it's good to keep going now. So I need to get there's some very subtle kind of icy uh, shapes on the road down here. Some of that bluish um, color. I've I've already put some of it in, obviously wet into wet. But I need to do a couple of those down here while I'm letting this dry a little bit more. And then I think I can come up and start painting um, the big connected shape. Um, get that snow in a little bit more, um, and especially on this side, and start getting some of those details in. So, um, again, it shouldn't take too long to kind of bring this to some semblance of finish for you, but I don't know how we're doing on time. Oh, we've got plenty of time. Another question just popped up here is about if you use masks. Do you, do you no. use masks sometimes, or what do you think about that? No. So um, I should talk about that for a second because there's there's a reason I don't use masking fluid. Um, it, it lends a really uh, a stiffness to your painting when you're doing that. And I try to explain my students in my workshops. We always do a couple of lessons that are just about. Uh, I'll just give them a shape. I'll, I'll set, give them a photo of a cow or something, and I tell them just paint the silhouette of that cow. Um, just with gray paint. So you're painting that cow. That's a positive shape. Then I have them pull out another piece of paper and mix a bigger puddle and they have to paint a gray square and leave the shape of that cow behind the negative shape. And that it's obviously it's never, it's always worse when you're doing the negative shape. Um, you know, it's yeah. the way it is. but it, that little bit of incorrectness, that's what gives your paintings a looseness, okay? If all you're doing, if you're using masking fluid, it's constantly positive shapes. You're masking out positive shapes. You're not painting around it, creating a negative shape. So 
the, that again, that kind of helps your painting not look so tight and contrived. That's true. If you're not using masking yeah. fluid. So, um, that's a big reason why I don't use it. Plus it's, I'm lazy, it's just another step. You know, you gotta put that on and let it dry and paint over yeah. it and dry and pull it off. And I don't like having to sit around and wait. That exactly, way. yeah. That takes, that, that, that takes forever and, you know, um, too much work for not, you know, for I, nothing, almost nothing. Everything about it lends a, a tightness to your painting when you're using it because you got to sit around and wait for things to dry. You do a wash, you got to wait for your wash to dry before you can pull it off. Uh, and then you got to sit and soften. I mean, ugh, no, don't use it. Yeah, exactly. You do, you, you, you have the, the, the medical stuff to practice your patient, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. You okay. don't need to do that in a fresh water color. Yeah, I want to keep it nice and fresh as much as I can. Big brush, exactly. keep it immediate. You know, and again, that goes back to that whole uh, painting outside too. Um, you know, you don't have time to do masking fluid and stuff when you're it's painting. Possible. Yeah, I agree with you. I was telling them the how how things are almost the same for paintings, like like I was saying. Uh, I'm a uh, basically landscape painter and plein air painting too. And how many things we have in common? Just to choose this this way, we, we like almost the same. Like yep. the same way to, to approach the paint. So that's amazing. And, and I do tell people. I have the same opinion in everything, almost everything. Same yeah. opinion, yeah. Yeah. Of course. You know, and this doesn't, this doesn't make this the right way to paint. It's just my way to paint. Obviously, yeah. there's a lot yeah. of people who like masking fluid, and that's fine. But for what I'm trying to achieve in my paintings, it just doesn't work. Um, that's I true. I don't like it. Yeah. Yeah. So again, I'm just doing a couple of these little icy spots here, and then we're also going to have the um, the color of the steeple and some of the trees reflecting down here later too. So um, I'll get back to that. But I just needed a couple more harder edged shapes up here before I get up into this other area. Okay, now I'm going to start painting this big um, connected shape up here. I'm going to leave a little bit of that lighter blue behind for the snow. So I'm going to be painting the rooftop connected with the steeple and the trees. And then I'm going to paint the front of this house, but I'm going to leave that blue for the snow on the roof. And I'm going to leave some of that blue for the snow down here, some of it for the roof of this car. Okay. So um, there's areas that I have to darken up a little bit and there's areas that I'm just going to paint around from that first wash that I put on. The, the darker trees are going to be at the end, the dry brush. So I'm not really worried about those yet. I'm going to paint through those right now. Want a little more color on there. I can still see just a little bit of my pencil mark for the rooftop of that house, enough to paint around it a little bit here. Okay, so that is this area of the roof that I just painted, leaving behind some of the lighter stuff for that one. I'm gonna go ahead and get that church steeple painted up. Fill this in a little bit. I don't wanna to get too many dry edges over here yet. I'm gonna have to start adding some brown and everything onto here pretty quickly. I have a paper towel in my hand a lot too. I rinse it off, dry it off on a sponge, kind of get some more paint off it. Especially now, um, I, I just dried it, but I, I don't think it's totally dry. So I don't want to create blooms. So I'm being very careful as to how much uh, water I have on my brush. Using some alizarin crimson, some burnt sienna, more gold for the edge of that uh, building where it's facing the sun, maybe keep it a little warmer over here on that side. It's reflecting the sunrise. A bit more. But once again, I'm painting this and my eyes are really squinted down. Um, I'm not seeing a lot of detail. Still trying to see big shapes of 
of color and value. You have such a limited palette, too, huh? What's that? You have you have, you have um, a limited palette colors in your palette. Yeah, there, yeah. There's not a bit. I have a few cools, a couple of earth tones, and some warm, you know, yellows and reds. That's it. They're mostly just versions of primary yeah. colors. I've got about exactly. five blues, exactly four yeah. yellows, and three or four reds. You know, they're all yeah. primaries. I don't have the secondary and tertiary yeah. colors. I don't have orange, exactly. and purple, and green green paint, I mix them. I have a limited palette and I prefer to mix those colors up. More than enough. Yeah, oh yeah, probably too many actually. <laughs> That's true. That's yeah. the, the, the main thing to get the mood to, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, if, if you're using the, a limited palette to mix it, all these colors are affecting the other colors and you have a more, a more cohesive painting. You're jumping around and adding, you know, from 38 different colors on your palette, um, it gets broken up a lot, very, a lot easier. So it's, it's just much better to work with fewer colors and mix what you need. Otherwise, you're going to get a nice illustration. Something like that. Yeah. Getting a little darker on the top here now. Okay, just trying to keep this all merging, still working wet into wet, just like I did on that first wash. Okay, I'm not painting over here for a little bit and then jumping over here and painting. I'm trying to work from a nice edge on this shape so that these colors are still merging together. Okay. Gotta darken up this bottom half a bit more. And that's going to help to define the front of that little house there. Okay, so now I got to start joining in underneath here. It's been a big pleasure for me to to watch you watching you here, um, Andy. Um, yeah, I just realized now I I'm not, you know, I'm not watching my friends painting and. I know lots of watercolors, a lot of arches, and I can watch them painting just here in the demo livre. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> Thank you. Even when we are like working together, I don't see them painting. I'm just right. you know, doing yeah, my I job know. and I, I doing the meetings and all this stuff. I don't, I don't see them painting. I'm just enjoying a lot seeing you here. <laughs> It's I, crazy. The same way I go paint with my friends, and there's times I'm like, I don't want to paint. I just want to sit and watch them and learn, see how they do it. Yep. It's very nice. Okay, so there's the front of that house, leaving again, leaving behind that little bit of uh, snow. There's another smaller little rooftop down there I can leave behind. Just trying not to overfill, get a little bit warmer as it's facing the sun again. Go from those cool colors to a warmer color on the front there. It's, uh, all that stuff is affected by the sunrise, obviously. And you have a big contrast already. Yeah, that's, I mean, it's exactly, the, it, it's a big shape. Big wow, display. wow, yeah. It's already starting to look like something, even with the minimum amount of detail. Okay, that's good enough for that. Start working my way over here into these trees across the way. I want to leave that front of the church a little bit brighter if I can. And I just painted it, so I have to be careful that I'm not coming in with too wet of 
uh, color on my brush here. I just want a little sliver of light up there. There we go. Okay, so now this is almost just paint. I'm gonna try and dry brush a couple of these trees in here. Very little water. I'm just gonna use the, a smaller brush um, with mostly just paint on here. And I'm just gonna start dragging this using the texture of the paper to create those little wintry trees. Same thing up here before this has a chance to dry, maybe connect a little bit of those guys up here too. Okay, so that dry brush is such a quick, easy way to show those um, wintry yeah. trees. That have been That's true. Yeah. This is a hard thing to do. You have to yeah. keep them, uh, yeah, to keep it fresh and the gestual of the thing is. Get Not it. much about watercolor painting that's easy, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All timing and consistency of your paper and consistency of your wash. And... It takes a long time to get uh, comfortable painting with it. Okay, now I'm going to paint around the, the rooftop of that car just a little bit as I'm going on with this shape. And I'm gonna try not to overfill. There's a couple little gaps in here that can become street signs or people or you know whatever, if you leave some little holes in your washes behind. So uh, I'd never try and uh, put too much in there and, and just kind of make it too solid. You can always come back in and fill in some of those little areas if you need to. Uh, but for now, I'm trying to keep it um, nice and fresh. I gotta get some of that off of there, that gold. I'm trying to get it bluer as I go back. So I'm gonna lighten this a little bit and get a little bit bluer as I go back in the distance, just to try and make it a little bit more convincing. I don't want this as dark as this right up in front. So I'm just gonna gradually start lightening that shape up as I go back. But again, it's gotta come right to the top of that car and up and over it. And then down again. So that's gonna be for the roof of that car. And this is what I was talking about, negative painting. Okay, I'm not painting the yes. car, I'm painting around the car to show it. Yes. Big difference. Just get a little cooler and simpler as I go back into the distance here. Make sure I'm getting the line of that street correct. I use my finger to smudge edges a lot too and soften them when I get back there if I need to. Yes. Okay, so that whole big shape was painted together, varying the color inside of it, but the contour of that shape because the paper was dry, I've got a little variety of dry brush, you know, edges and some of the values are changed, but it's still all connected into one shape, all that stuff over there. Big shapes, that's what I look for. Some of this off of here again. I need just a little bit of blue on the back end of that car, a little bit more here. Leave some of the light facing the sun. Okay, now I need to darken up that snow. I use cerulean blue. Cerulean blue is just about my favorite blue. I love the granulation of it. Uh, I use it mixed with cobalt in a lot of my skies. It, it mixes, um, it's not so intense so that the purples that I mix with cerulean blue are a little bit more natural looking. It's just a nice color. Yeah, that's true. And it's one of the colors that changes a lot from brand to brand, right? Yep. It's hard, changes a lot. Like Exactly. And they kind of filter out and dry at different rates. You know, cerulean's a little heavier than some other colors. So if you just let your washes dry, you know, yeah. and you kind of, they kind of granulate out and you get these cool effects. Yeah. And you love granulate, right? What's that? You, you, look, you look for graduation. Oh, yeah, I love that. Yeah. 
So I'm keeping that nice bright at the edge of the road back here if I can. Just darkening up that snow. And we're still gonna have some more dark shapes here later too, but I also need to darken up that reflection a bit. That's not quite so obvious of a transition there. Okay, so that's another big shape on the other side and, and it's also connected to this shape via the car, okay? So everything I've painted so far is one big connected shape, all right? And that's what yes. I was talking about before. It's so hard to see that way. We look at this scene and we see two houses and a car and a church and signs and trees and we don't yeah. see the big stuff. You know, you gotta yeah. see the big stuff. You have to turn on your um, artist view to see the things in terms of painting, right? Yep. As a, a visual language, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, yeah, there's a difference, exactly. The visual language that we have to use, we're trying to convince the world or the viewer of a three-dimensional world on you know a millimeter thick piece of paper. Uh, and so we have to use things like value and shape and tone and hue and everything. To yeah. When some student asked me how to paint a car, um, I tell them like, forget about it. it's a car, it's not a car. Exactly, it's just a shape. Just the shape of a car, it's not a car. Forget about the, the, the meaning of the thing. That's when you crazy. forget about the meaning, you can like follow the shape, how the, for, the, 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 the format of the shape. That's great advice. Yeah. Okay, so I'm starting to get that house in there involved with the two. Now I'm gonna do some dry brushing of these trees up into the sky. Whoops, that was probably way too much. That's a big shape, but. This yellow is so strong, huh? Yeah, the, the, well, the, I'm trying to show not just the trees, but the fact that they're glowing through that sunset. So, um, yeah. you know, I don't want to make it too yellow here, but I, I definitely want to start with it warm and then work my way down to darker shapes down below. And I got to make sure it's mostly just paint again. There's a mood already. Basically. I'm going to start down here when I'm doing my dry brushing, because if it's too thick, that's okay. I don't want to start up here and accidentally have too much paint on my brush and, and, you know, and paint a pumpkin sitting up at the top of the tree. So I'm going to start down here and kind of get a feel for how my brush is acting. And then if it feels right, then I'll start pulling it up to where I need to up above. Just kind of pushing it around lightly at first, pushing a little bit harder if I want a bigger, uh, more of a clump of trees somewhere. But this is almost, there's hardly any water on here. You gotta be really careful. Like I said, I don't wanna paint a solid shape in there right now. I'll, I can paint all the branches and stuff later. So fresh and simple, man, this is, Right? This is just great. This is the yeah. this is what attracted me to watercolor. Like I said, exactly. I don't want to labor over something for a week. I love the immediacy and the freshness of watercolor. So fun. Leave a couple of gaps for that sun poking through in a spot or two, if I can. All right, so we've got a, a majority of that big tree already knocked in. Right down here, the sun is really kind of poking through that tree. So I switched from that 
darker um, kind of a green brown to more red and orange for my dry brushing because this is right where the sun is poking through so I want more color in it down here. All right. Well, that's working okay. Um, I can start doing the dry brush on the other side too. What am I doing on time? Still good. Again, starting at the bigger area, make sure I don't have too much paint on my brush. And then as it's running out of paint, then I start coming up into the sky and doing a little bit more of the dry brush. This is helping to define the top of that little car that's parked over here. You know, whatever, just stuff. All right, so I've got that in. Now it's time to let's start putting in some reflections down here. Uh, give this a little chance to dry up. There you go, yeah. Because that's going to add a lot to this too to make the road look wet once you start showing some of those reflections down below. It's kind of important. That's an amazing view. Um... So next year, huh? I'm going to paint some tropical landscape here. <laughs> <laughs> Can't wait. This is beautiful. Mm. Reflections of the trees down here. Get this little puddle here. Again, using my finger, if I feel a shape is too hard edged or something, just kind of soften it. That really helps to make the road look wet with those reflections now, okay, that's in there. Now I need to start getting some brown and stuff in my reflections for the church steeple. And again, making sure that I'm putting it in the right spot. I want it in a puddle and I want it below the, the steeple, obviously. Yeah. So those, those blue things that I put on before are kind of the ice on top and the brighter orange spots are the wet reflecting the sky. So the brighter orange spots are where I'm putting in my reflections. All right, got that knocked in now. Same thing over here, a couple darks on that side. This is when it starts getting dangerous. You know, now it's time to start putting in details. And, you know, I mean, you saw me do big shapes with a big brush and, <laughs> on, and now it's like, oh, the little stuff starts going in and it's a dangerous time. Um, you yeah, gotta, that's true. Got to make sure I'm still squinting and, um, you know, painting the big stuff as much as I can. Need a little bit of a dark at the bottom of the snow. Over here, just a couple of clumps of shadow or dirt or something where they plowed the snow off the street. Help get that edge back. 
Okay, at the back end of that car now, I need to get that little dark shape in. Just a shape. That's we were talking about that. There's the there's the car. Okay, the back end. Dark. Enough oh. is enough. Yeah. Before this dries, I want to see if I can scrape out a couple little power lines. Some of those little highlights. I think it's already starting to dry a bit, but um, I can zoom. Can you see that? Okay. Oh yeah, yeah. sure. I'm going to not mm -hmm. use my fingernail to scratch in a couple of power lines before it was all wet, okay? It just fresh color, you know, if you concentrate on big shapes with a big brush, don't overwork it, keep things clean. Uh, so important, you know, with watercolor that, that you keep it yeah. fresh um, and don't try and make everything just right. doesn't matter. Just as long as you're squinting and painting the big shapes, the viewer will see what you want them to see. It's important to leave some of the viewer's imagination, you know, uh, so they become part of the, the painting. The more you spell everything out for them with a bunch of detail, everybody sees the same thing. It's just kind of, you may as well just frame the photograph at that point. Uh, I want to keep some mystery in the painting. Yeah. And the most important is right there already. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, everything you need already is pretty much in there. You've got the viewer convinced of the season, time of day, you know, what kind exactly. of yeah. time it is. Anything above yeah. and beyond this is just, you know, you're, you're risking, it still needs detail, obviously, but you're, you're kind of risking overkill at some point of putting more and more in it. Just because it's in the photo doesn't mean it has to be in your painting. Yeah. The water in the ground is right there already, so the most yeah. important it's beautiful thank you the last steps the last five minutes in the painting divides the 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 pros from the the kids right <laughs> exactly it really does yeah <laughs> the last five minutes that's it yeah but this is the stuff that everybody sees that's what i always tell people don't don't worry about the details. Everybody, when you look at this, you see the trees and the car and the windows and that, you know, but it's worry about the big stuff so that, you know, these little touches that I put at the end now, now they, now they actually mean something and they're adding to the painting. I'm not relying on details to make the painting or to save the painting. It was already working after the big shapes. Okay. Now these are just accents to help it out and make it a bit more convincing. And I got a couple of windows. Be careful when you're putting windows on houses, okay? I just do a quick little dry brush stroke more often than not for those two. Um, and just indicate them. I try not to make them too perfect. Yeah. Just a couple quick little shapes is all. You got windows on there. There we go. Okay, this needs to be, um, this tree trunk and some of this needs to be a bit darker. I'm not painting that sign, by the way, that can go. Um, I might put this sign in, in front of here. I'm gonna try and put that little figure stooped over in there. Uh, but we're getting pretty close to getting this wrapped up for you. need to put a couple of those branches going up. It's just all dry brush right now. I can paint the branches in now. I wanted that contrast in there. I'm gonna finish this, this demo, I'm gonna paint too. My, my head's just shaking like, um, you know, <laughs> I need to paint something right now. <laughs> you're, you're waiting for me to ruin it, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> The worst thing to be like a um, a host a host is, uh, is you, you you keep watching people painting you cannot just oh, it just kills you right I have to choose yeah yeah I have to choose to pay attention or 
in what were you saying or jump in my in my in my place here and start to paint too. Exactly. Most people in the demo during the demo they paint during the demo. So uh, oh, really? to, yeah, yeah, yeah. They oh, set up the, the things and for sure they're like following you and oh. at the end of the demo you'll be like yeah, and they're gonna post on, on the social media with the hashtag um, Eu na demo are you guys? I'll show you later. Oh, that's really cool. Good. Yeah, it's gonna pop up lots of painting I with really this like subject. Yeah. This is more than a demo. This is a perfect class. Thank you, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> it's so technical. Thanks a lot. Yeah, no problem. More than we expected. Oh, my pleasure. I love doing this stuff. Thanks, man. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna paint this little figure kind of huddled over here, just trying to get the shape of somebody working on their snowblower, whatever. Well, it is winter gear, shoveling. Doesn't really look like a figure, but I know he's there. Okay, I'm gonna put that little sign there. And that sign is also gonna help with the contrast of the glow of the sunset, okay? Um, so I'm just gonna go ahead and put some in. Um, kind of a backlit shape there. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, I hope people are understanding you. Um, oh. The thing about the, this little sign is, that was very nice. So how you choose the big one instead of the, 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 the yeah. little one and vice versa and why that's so important in the yep. process and the creative process and some people has hard times to have have time hard, uh, hard time to understand that so yeah, this is a little obtrusive this is just a little yeah. detail to add into things so um, in my mind anyways i don't doesn't make it the right choice like i said but I just kind of viewed that as a little bit more of an important sign in the whole scheme of things there. Get that guy shoveling better. And there's a window on this house too. Whatever, just some shapes. Just wanna obliterate some of that detail over there. All right, um, last thing, maybe a couple of the power poles and street lamps coming in over there. That's amazing. That roof is full of snow already. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Wow. That's full of snow. There you go. This is amazing. Yeah. Little street light coming in, some power poles. I don't shy away from putting in power poles and street lamps and stuff. They're just nice shapes. Um, I like to paint the connecting shapes of all the wires and stuff coming in and out of the scene too. You know, that's kind of fun. So um, I don't, I don't yeah. need power poles out of my paintings. I put them in. Some people think they're ugly, but it's part of the landscape. Yeah. That's true. And here is another big question uh, about the gouache, the white stuff. Do you use that? Like a little spots of oh, yeah. white? white um, sure. So now there's, so there's a couple of cars coming down the street with their headlights on way back in the distance, okay? Um, gotta use it. I didn't paint around their headlights, but now I could come in if I want just a couple of brighter spots. I'll use a tube of gouache and I just stick a small brush right into the tube if I'm gonna use it, okay? Um, so I'll get a small synthetic brush, get it damp, stick it in the tube of gouache. That's it. And I can pop in a couple little headlights or something, you know, coming in way in the distance there of some cars coming into town. Let me zoom in so you can see yes. that. Yes, 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 yes. Perfect. You know? So that's yeah. much better than, oh, sorry for the shaky camera. It's much better no than problem. fluid. It's much better to, than worrying about those two little headlights while I'm putting that big wash on. Okay, worry about the big problems. At the end, you can come in and put little touches of things on, you know, to, to make it all come together. Uh, but yeah, don't, I have no problems using a little bit of gouache where I need to. Now, say I wanted to add some snow over here that I might have missed. 
I'll mix the gouache, you know, with blue paint, obviously. I don't, you don't have to leave it white all the time. You can tint it with your watercolor paint. But um, yeah. Um, I think the snow on the left side under the house has to be just a touch darker. Let me get this off of here. It's went a little bit there. All right, I think that's just about done. It leaves us 15 minutes for Q&A if you have questions on anything. But. Yes, sure. Man, it's amazing. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. Be beautiful painting. Thanks, Thanks Andy. Uh, yeah, let's check here, double check if people have some questions, maybe about materials and the brush. People for sure is gonna ask you about the brush. I saw you using like a black velvet or something like that, right? Yeah. Or... So these are those silver black velvet brushes um, that I like to use. They're a, a blend of natural and synthetic hair. Um, and the, the, so the nice thing about them is they're, you know, the pure squirrel mops are pretty floppy. Those big black yes, yes. brushes. Yes. Um, and even though, you know, most of the time when I'm using them is just in the early stage when I'm trying to paint the big wash. But uh, I still, every once in a while, I want to cut around a smaller shape while I'm painting those big shapes. So the fact that there's a blend of some synthetic hair in here too keeps it a little bit stiffer. Um, you can have a little bit more of a point on there. So you get, just have a little bit more control, but it still serves as a good um, uh, moppy brush. So I start my painting with those big moppy brushes. Then when I go to do these connected shapes, I kind of use a size 14 or so, uh, more like a sable brush. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Still a natural hair brush. It's still going to hold a lot of paint and water, but it's a smaller size and with a little better point because now I'm doing a little bit more drawing, uh, you know, with that and trying to create these nice little elegant shapes around the painting. Um, so, uh, so you kind of have to find that intermediate brush. Again, natural hair. It's going to hold a lot of paint and water but a little better point for drawing with it. And at the end, that's when I switch to more like the Escoda um, Perla, or the, I love this little brush um, by Da Vinci, little synthetic brush, uh, it's very light and I can just kind of push it around. I use that for my dry brushing, you know, little shapes. Um, but so I, I go from big natural to small synthetic because when it comes time to putting in your, your details, you don't want anything that holds a lot of water and paint. Okay, when, I, when I'm doing dry brushing, I gotta make sure that's mostly just paint. And the synthetic brushes don't hold as much water. So they're perfect for the, the smaller little windows and, and you know signs and people and all that kind of stuff. So uh, that, that's the progression of, my, of the brushes. I usually just use round, I like round brushes. I like the feel of them, I learned with them. Um, I know a lot of people prefer flats. But um, I don't know. I like the the bulk of these, uh, the the big body of a round brush, and then the little point that you get that you can still draw with, it and do some calligraphy work is kind of fun. Sure, perfect, great, cool. Yeah, so we have still we still have ten minutes, um, ten minutes meeting, and feel free to show us whatever you want to. Um, some paintings. I, I think we can like we can give your contact. Um, if oh. people wants to take class from you, um, Andy, or even buy some some painting or buy your uh, calendar. I saw your your calendar for to for two thousand one and oh yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> how, how people can reach you. Yeah, so my website is um, I should write it down on here. It's probably easier if I write it down, right? Perfect. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> the website and oh, the one I was going to type it into the chat. Yeah. Well, and about your online class, um, are they in the? Um, yeah. So can you the, type the website too? 
the Tucson Arcade. Well, so we have a lot of, we're offering a couple more shorter um, Zoom classes this winter. Um, we haven't picked the dates yet, but there'll probably be one kind of mid-December um, in about another month and a half, and then probably another one in January or February. Uh, but we'll have a couple more like four day, three or four day workshops um, via Zoom. And those will be on our website too. So you already typing that in there? I've got ours in there. I'm looking okay. at Tucson. Uh, yeah, um, evensonartstudio.com is the website. Um, so if you're interested in a class, um, you can just go and log on, you know, sign up right on the, off of the website. Um, Danielle has been in there before over Zoom. It works pretty well um, for, over the lessons. Um, the one thing you don't get, you know, over Zoom, obviously, is the, um, is, um, you know, that personal interaction of being in a room with me and I'm walking around and helping you and able to critique your work. But, um, you know, I don't do a lot of critiques anyways in my workshops because uh, it's kind of pointless. You're, you're not painting your best stuff in a workshop. You're learning something new. Um, so I want people to feel comfortable not painting well in a workshop yeah, exactly. basically, and not have the pressure of putting something up for a critique. So, yeah, I don't really do a lot of critiques, but if, if somebody has something that they did in the workshop um, and I can't see it on the computer screen or on Zoom, I'll just tell them to email it to me and I can give you some feedback, you know, that way. Um, you know, we'll start the morning. I, I always kind of do a review of what we talked about the day before and kind of set the stage for the day coming in again the next day. But um, yeah, they've been good. We could, They're kind of half days. A full day in front of a computer screen is too much. So I try and yeah. keep like four hours, uh, yeah. noon to four, mm -hmm. noon to six or something in the middle of the day. Uh, so yeah, coming. that sounds great. So people wants to to buy some some painting from you can contact you through the internet through through the um, website too, right? Yep, the right through the website. All the paintings are available. I've got another batch that are going to be going up this week. But another eight or ten paintings that I, I usually send them and, and Laura up, uploads them and puts them on for sale, but uh, yeah, you can go see what's available and what's sold and and uh, keep checking it out. And um, you can buy them right off the website. We'll ship them to you, whatever. So um, still working on that book. I don't have a book yet, but I've got a DVD for sale too that I filmed in England a couple of years ago, a plein air DVD. I know a lot of people have seen that already, but, um, but that's kind of fun too. You get to see me do, I think there's five paintings on there. I'm doing a value study. You know, um, I didn't really talk about these, but these are the kind of lessons I do in my workshop where we do a value study and then a color version of them both. But this is all about, you know, making that plan, finding those big shapes and then letting it translate and trying to paint those same shapes in, in color. Yes. Uh -huh. But um, keeping it simple, it's easier said than done, but it really does work. You know, it's, it's a different way of thinking when you first start um, like I said, trying to join all those shapes from the mountain that's 20 miles away to the barn that's right in front of you and painted it. Yes, well. yes, yes. But wow. uh, yeah. it's so important to find lost edges and, and take advantage of all that, that fluidity of watercolor, you know? Yeah, that's beautiful. Yes, great. For sure, people is going to like look, look for you. And yes, um, man, I'm just looking for forward to meet you personally here next year i hope everything you know will be who knows we cannot like say anything but the plan is there already the dates there november 11 12 13th and take laura with you too if you, you your family has plenty of space to you guys to spend here awesome. some days and have fun even know these people the watercolor the brazilian artists and share a little bit personally right um andy uh what could be a final thoughts for the brazilian artists for people who like uh, you just shared this amazing wonderful work and what could you say like at the end yeah i want to give a piece of advice to uh and it's something that i hear from my students a lot when they come in and take a workshop and they're all they're kind of looking for you know, uh, kickstart and, um, you know, someone to help them make uh, better paintings, obviously. But I tell them, uh, and a very common thing that I hear from them is that they haven't painted in 
you know, two months or three months, they haven't had time to paint. And, um, but I tell them if, if the problem is if you don't have four hours to pull out all your supplies and sit down and do a whole painting that they don't yeah. do anything. And I tell them how important it is that 10 minutes, you know, just pulling it out, painting little, um, where did I put that thing? You know, just sitting and practicing little shapes of figures, you know, even if it's for five minutes, um, get your brushes wet and, yes. and mm -hmm. uh, find scrap pieces of paper, or, you know, backs of old paintings, mix puddles and just work on, uh, you know, practice working from a, a bead. Let me go back to this uh, above here for the picture in picture. This is such an important thing that I have my students practice um, in my workshops where we're mixing uh, like three puddles of, of color um, and it goes back to painting that big connected shape, you know, where you're, you're switching gears from painting a building to a tree to the road and, and vehicles and stuff. But um, so I tell them, if all you have is, you know, five or 10 minutes in your day, that, that's plenty of time to work on your watercolor skills. OK, yeah, that's true. And, um, you know, mix a few little puddles of, of color and just kind of practice yeah. keeping a bead, you know, and reloading your brush a lot keeping a nice wet edge built up. And then when you've got to transition to another color, you know, rinse your brush off, dry it off, grab another color, come back, touch that bead, paint a little bit with another color, work on getting nice transitions. You know, just again, just kind of playing around for a few minutes. You got to change the color again, rinse your brush off, dry it off, grab a new color, come back, start painting again. Okay. So this is, this is the technical part of watercolor painting that, um, you don't want to be thinking about this kind of stuff in the middle of a painting. So much that you have to be aware of in your painting. The timing, how wet is my paper, you know, the, the consistency of my puddles, you know, all these other things. You don't want to have to be held up because you're not sure how to transitional, uh, you know, swatch a color. So if you practice these things, even for just a few days, then when you're in the guts of your painting, you can focus on more important issues and you're not worried about basic technical things like this. So it's very important to just kind of spend a few minutes once in a while painting positive shapes and then paint the positive shape of a figure and then sit and mix another big puddle and try and recreate that shape, not by painting it, but by painting around that shape. Okay. And paint a negative shape and try and recreate that okay and just kind of work on those brush skills you know it'll pay off in the long run then when you do have a day where you have four hours to paint you don't feel rusty exactly then kind of working a little bit you pick up your brushes yes. more familiar yes. and you can kind of dive in okay yes so you're saying uh don't don't use your practicing time to make a masterpiece you don't need to make a, a masterpiece every day you have to practice little things and you know brush strokes and yeah that's perfect yeah great thanks okay. this, this will speed up your learning curve a lot more than just trying new paintings all the time you're just going to be spinning your wheels you know and then, then when it comes time you got to paint then you can focus more on on the big stuff and you're not you know how to do dry brushing then, you know, pick up little pieces of paper and just practice pushing that brush around and getting a texture. You don't want to practice dry brushing on your paintings and risk ruining it. Okay. Yes. Great. Thanks. That was a good tip. That was a, um, a, a good, good final, good end. Man, um, I would thank you a lot. That was a great time for me. It was so special to have you here. Uh, this this demo livery project is growing up. You are like, uh, we, we did the top of the, 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 these meetings and who knows what's going to happen in the future. So yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah we, we have to uh, reinvent this, ourselves during this process. And uh, this demo livery, these meetings is part of that. So um, you are part of that too. Thanks a lot, Andy. Let me just, you know, see you again here. Thanks for having me, Ari. It was really good to see you. Nice to meet you. Let me find here again. I lose you. Okay. Oh. Sorry, you know. Okay. I'm going to go back to my other computer here. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> that, okay, let me see here. Replace that. Oh, there you go. Here we are. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah.
here at both at the same time. Um, Laura, thanks for support, supporting us, yeah. right? Me and Andy. Um, Alini, Alini, my wife has to has to take some class from you to help me here too, for sure. You're gonna have you're gonna have her call like in a few minutes to, to teach no her. No problem. Happy to yeah, have. Cool. Great. Thanks, Andy. Thanks a lot, man. Um, um, we are waiting for you here next year for sure. Look um, forward to it. Can't wait. There was a there was a big pleasure these last two hours. I thank you very much and. Hope people find you, take class with you, and for sure, uh, this is a good chance for us now during this whole process um, to reach each other, right? And yeah. let's take the, that opportunity. And Thanks. man, thank you a lot. My pleasure. Stay safe, everyone. Thanks for having me. Okay. Valeu, gente. Obrigado. Tá? Tivemos Andy Evans aqui com a esposa dele, Laura, ajudando. Uh, foi um prazer ter vocês aqui também uh, vamos encerrando estamos no tempo, quatro horas espero que vocês tenham aproveitado Eli, obrigado pela ajuda no closed caption uh, gente, obrigado para vocês também obrigado a todos, valeu ter participado tá? uma boa semana para vocês uh, vamos se manter conectado, terça-feira estamos aqui de novo, anuncio o que, que a gente vai trabalhar estejam seguros, livres de notícia ruim Uh, alimente a cabeça com coisa boa, vamos se manter seguro, firme, criando o nosso novo futuro, porque o futuro da nossa mão, o que a gente criar agora, o que a gente fizer, uh, vai ser marcado para sempre na nova forma de viver na sociedade. Então, obrigado, gente, valeu. Andy, thanks again. My pleasure. See you guys later. Thanks My pleasure, you. too. Thanks, guys. Bye. Tchau, Bye, everyone. Obrigado, Appreciate gente. It. Thanks a lot. You bet.